Gracias Paula, gracias al, al comité de seminarios por invitarme a, a presentarles nuestro trabajo. Eh, estoy muy entusiasmada a ver qué, qué les parece. Eh, por favor pregúntenme eh, cuando haya algo que, que les dé curiosidad o que no se entienda. Eh, lo único es que el seminario lo voy a, lo voy a dar en inglés, espero que eh, no, sea, no sea un problema, eh, pero creo realmente que, que va a ser mejor de esa forma si no... Eh, Hablar en español de mi trabajo me va a costar muchísimo. Eh, estoy tratando de verme. A ver. Eh, no sé cómo hacer para... Bueno, no importa. Eh, so. As many of you uh, over there, what my lab is really fascinated by is the process by which a single cell gives rise to these amazing organisms with very diverse and complex structures. And in particular, as Paula alluded to, we're fascinated by the diversity of different cell types that make up these different organisms and how they arise during development. And in particular, we're interested in understanding the gene regulatory mechanisms that give rise to all these diversity of cell types, starting from a single cell with one genome. And to address these questions, we use the nematode C. elegans. And we do so for two main reasons. We think C. elegans is really a fantastic model to study or to address the question of cell diversification. And that is because this nematode in the adult state has 959 somatic cells but within this relatively small number of cells, it has a very large cell type diversity with over 100 different neuron types, different types of muscles, epithelia, uh, uh, reproductive system, an excretory system, and so on and so forth. So we think this little animal strikes a perfect balance between simplicity and complexity that allows us to really look at the process of cell diversification in um, from both a very, um, a lower solution and, and whole animal point of view, and yet also zoom into what's happening in individual cells in, in this animal and during development. And the other reason why the worm, why, why the, the nematode C. elegans is such a wonderful system is because the way in which this animal develops is invariant from one individual to the next. And this allowed John Sulston in a heroic effort to map the series or the pattern of cell divisions that gives rise to every single cell, every single somatic cell in this animal. And what that means is that if I'm studying a particular neuron in the head of this worm, I know that in every single individual, that neuron arises through the, through the very specific pattern of cell divisions that is highlighted here. And that gives us a tremendous power to try to understand what happens during the developmental process to these cells. How do they change over time and how do they acquire their identities? Now, the ability to, uh, to look at cells developing over time with such resolution has led us, as I said, to ask questions of, of how does diversity develop over time. And the story that I will tell you about today tries to address exactly that. And what I will show you is that the history of different cells matters a lot in the sense that we can have two cells at the end point of development that uh, express the same transcription factors that would trigger the same terminal differentiation program in these two cells. And yet, because these two cells have different trajectories or different transcriptional histories, they will give rise to different cell types. Um, now, I also want to very briefly mention that, uh, as Paula also said, my lab is more generally interested in gene regulatory mechanisms of how different cell types form. And we have been also very much focused on micronase, I, and I would be happy to discuss with, uh, with you if you're interested in that aspect of your work later on. But back to the, the story for today, in order to get into the story uh, that I will tell you about, I would like to refresh with you a concept that I'm, I'm sure you're all very familiar with, and that is the fact that the generation of different cell types during development relies on the combinatorial action of transcription factors. So transcription factors will give 
will turn on expression of genes that will give different cells their unique properties that make them a particular cell type. But in, uh, in a way, there's uh, not enough transcription factors to specify every single cell in the, um, in the body of an animal, for example. So the use of combinations of transcription factors has enabled evolution and has enabled nature to uh, be able to specify many more cell types than transcription factors are available. And so what I'm showing here is an example of this. This has been particularly uh, well studied um, in the development of nervous systems. And this is work from uh, Oliver Hobart, who has studied these very deeply in, in C. elegans, in the C. elegans nervous system. The worm has 118 different neuron classes. And for each of these classes, or for most of these classes in the lab of uh, Oliver Hobart, they have found combinations of transcription factors that uniquely define and are, uh, that uniquely define different uh, neurons and, and their properties. There are also very well studied examples, um, the, in, in this case, schematized from, from this review uh, in Drosophila, during, during Drosophila development, the overlap, overlapping expression of different transcription factors defines different regions in this embryo with different identities, or the beautiful examples from the developing spinal cord in, in vertebrates, primarily from, uh, from the lab of Tom Jessel, in which different morphogen gradients determine the spatial distribution of different transcription factors shown here as these bars. And if you look across, so the overlapping expression of all these transcription factors in this particular region will give rise to a particular uh, neuronal progenitor type. Um, and the overlapping expression of a different set of transcription factors here gives rise to a different progenitor type and so on and so forth. So, the, this ability of combinations of transcription factors to generate different cell types stems from the fact that uh, transcription factors act cooperatively at the level of enhancers of, um, that regulate gene expression. And in particular, most developmentally regulated genes are under control of combinatorial uh, um, of combinations of transcription factors that act cooperatively in such a manner. In this particular example, the purple gene requires for activation the presence of two transcription factors, the red and the blue transcription factor, such that a cell that expresses only one or the other is unable to turn on this gene, but uh, cells where expression of these two transcription factors intersect are able to turn on this gene, and this gene, in this case, gives this particular cell a certain set of properties. Now, at the molecular level, this combinatorial action of transcription factors has different mechanistic bases. And the, the most, um, or one of the, the best understood ones, is the fact that two transcription factors can form a complex, or two or more transcription factors can form a complex, and that can give them, for example, different specificity to recognize uh, new sequences on the DNA. So only when the two factors are, to, are together, they will bind to DNA. It is also possible that transcription factors without directly interacting with one another, but so in this case, factors that have adjacent sites on DNA are collectively able to displace nucleosomes and uh, in a way cooperate to, um, to open up chromatin and enable the binding of one another. In perhaps a similar uh, mechanism, but in a, sequential, uh, uh, in a sequential fashion, is the mechanism by which so-called pioneer factors cooperate with other transcription factors. Pioneer factors are described by their ability to bind to uh, nucleosomal DNA, thereby opening, removing those nucleosomes and opening up the binding site so that other transcription factors can now also bind. So all of these mechanisms enable uh, this cooperative action of transcription factors. But all of these mechanisms require that these cooperating transcription factors are present in the same cell at the same time, in, on the same piece of DNA at the same time. What I will tell you, and uh, sorry, when, um, so what this means is that typically the combinatorial action of transcription factors is determined by the spatial intersection or in other words, by the co-expression of two transcription factors in the same cell. 
as I was saying, what I will tell you about today is um, a case that we found in which two transcription factors, in this case, the red and the blue transcription factor, um, are required to turn on this purple gene and give these cells particular properties, but these transcription factors are separated over time. They act on the same locus, but at different time points. And much like spatial intersections, I will show you this is a mechanism to generate cellular diversity because a cell that expresses either only transcription factor one or only transcription factor two will acquire different, um, different cell identities. So this is essentially the concept uh, of, the, of the, or the main message that I wanted to give you. Now I will tell you where um, the cellular context or the, the biological context in which we, we studied these and, and how we came up with these ideas and, and the experiments that we did to test parts of the mechanism. Lisa, so, Lisa can I yes. interrupt you just a moment? Yes, I, please. I want, to ask, I want to say, if I understand well, these two transcription factors that interact could you say they build up a third transcription factor, which is a hybrid formed by the transcription one and the two, which is able to regulate things that they, they by themselves do not do? So this, this is known to happen in, uh, in, in the case of spatial intersection where two factors together can mm -hmm. actually generate a, a new complex that recognizes different sequences on the DNA than either factor alone. In this case that I will tell you about, Transcription factor one acts early, but transiently. Mm -hmm. And it will do something to the locus, and we will get to that. And uh, that, um, that initial activity of transcription factor one enables transcription factor two to uh. act on the same locus and drive transcription. In the absence of that transient activity of transcription factor one, transcription factor two is going to be unable to okay. activate the locus. Okay. So, and if you're already possibly thinking about changes in chromatin on this locus that can be triggered by transcription factor one, that is sort of the, the, the right direction. That's where we're, we're gonna get. Okay, thank you, Lisa, thank you. Thank you for the question. Please feel free to, uh, to interrupt. Um, it's more fun that way for me too, because I cannot see anyone. Um, okay, so, the system in which we, we started studying this question and, and the system that I will describe now in more detail is a, a pair of sensory neurons in the head of C. elegans. The worm, uh, the, C, the C. elegans nervous system is largely bilaterally symmetric and uh, that most neuron types exist in pairs, a left and a right pair that um, share similar properties. These two chemosensory neurons that we're going to be talking about are called ASCs. They are anterior sensory neuron E. And um, they are both, they, they share many morphological um, uh, symmetries. And they are also the only two cells out of the whole animal that express the transcription factor key one. Key one for chemosensory deficient, as in the mutant of key one the neuron fails to chemotax or to, to sense uh, salts in the environment. Now, even though these neurons are sy symmetric by many uh, different categories, they are actually functionally asymmetric. They're both, they both sense soluble um, chemicals in, in the soil, but they sense different sets of chemicals and they also respond differently to them. So for example, the left neuron senses primarily sodium, the right neuron senses primarily chloride. These different properties are, of course, given by differential gene expression or in, um, across these two neurons. Uh, for example, of uh, receptor guanylate cyclase genes geez, of the GCY family. And these are receptor guanylate cyclases that are actually involved in the sensing of these cues. And you can see here micrographs where we see GCY7 expressed only in the left neuron, but not in the right neuron, and a different GCY, GCY5, expressed in the right, but not in the left. Now, this asymmetry between these two neurons is determined by the asymmetric expression of a microRNA in the left neuron, but not in the right neuron. This microRNA was called LAUSI6, or laterally symmetric, because in the absence of this microRNA, the two neurons develop symmetrically. They both adopt a right-like state. So 
I was very intrigued when I, uh, during my postdoc in Oliver's lab about how uh, the asymmetry of Lausis X expression is established because this is what determines this asymmetry between these two neurons. So I started studying the transcriptional regulation of Lausis 6 because we knew that uh, it, it's regulated at the transcriptional level. Now, after a lot of work, the only regulator that we knew for Lausis 6 was the transcription factor Q1. We knew that Q1 is necessary for Lausis 6 expression. But of course, this cannot explain the asymmetry because as I just told you, Q1 is expressed in both neurons. So clearly there had to be something else. So after scratching our heads for a long time, uh, we actually looked at the lineage and we realized that the um, origin of these two neurons during development is actually very, very different. And it's actually asymmetric at a, at a really early time point at the four cell stage. So the left neuron derives from the so-called ABA blastomere, it's more anterior, that's why it has an A, while the right neuron derives from so-called ABP. So it's a more posterior blastomere. So at some point, these two lineages become symmetric again, and they give rise to two sets of cells on both sides of the head of the worm that include the left and the right ASC neurons. And at this point, these two cells start expressing key one, they adopt the ASC neuronal identity, and shortly after, the left ASC neuron starts expressing Lousy 6, and that expression is dependent on Q1. Uh, now, the interesting thing about this very early asymmetry is that we knew from work from uh, Catherine Good in the lab of Jim Priest and from a previous uh, colleague of mine, Richard Poole, also while he was a postdoc in Oliver Howard's lab, that there is an asymmetry that they, uh, there is a transcriptional asymmetry between the descendants of ABA and the descendants of ABP. And that is that only the descendants of ABA express these T-box transcription factors called TBX 37 and 38. Uh, I will talk about them together because they are a recent duplication. These factors are almost identical at the protein level and they are fully redundant genetically. Now, the interesting thing is that these two factors were necessary for the, for the asymmetry in ASC neurons. So a loss of function of TBX causes loss of Lausis 6 expression, while gain of function of t uh, or ex ectopic expression of TBX um, in, the, in the other lineage would induce Lausis 6 expression in um, in this cell as well. And what we found that was extremely uh, exciting was that there was a potential TBX binding site in the Lausis X locus itself, suggesting that maybe the TBOX factors could act on the Lausis X locus already at this point, prime it in some manner, such that when Q1 comes on, it's able to boost transcription of, um, of LAUSI6 in this neuron, but in the cell where TBX3738 were not expressed, LAUSI6 could never be activated by Q1. So we this suggested that there was this intersection of TBX3738 and Q1 on the LAUSI6 locus. However, there were many mechanistic questions because how, uh, what does this factor um, if it's really transiently expressed, which the Jim, uh, Jim Priest's lab had shown, how, what, does it, uh, what does it do to the Lausis 6 locus to make it competent for Q1 expression later on? And um, yeah, we had, in, in particular, we wanted to, uh, to really make sure whether this transcription factor was expressed only early on, transiently as had been proposed, or potentially maybe expression of this transcription factor persisted and TBX could act together with Q1 in a combinatorial manner as many other transcription factors do. So we really had a lot of questions about how, how does this work? And that is what Thomas Daniele and Julian Charrier, a postdoc and a PhD student in the lab set out to address. So the first thing that, uh, that they did was uh, to try to address, does, do the TBX transcription factors bind directly to the Lousy 6 locus early on? So these TBOX factors are expressed in eight cells out of this early stage embryo. 
Um, and what uh, Thomas did was he fused uh, TBX37 to GFP in a strain where he had deleted TBX38, or he fused TBX38 to GFP in a strain where he had deleted 37. So as I told you, they're redundant, but we wanted to make sure that the only source of protein was labeled with GFP. And then he used these strains to perform chromatin immunoprecipitation and sequencing. And here I'm compiling replicates from both 37 and 38 because they looked really identical. And what Thomas found was that there was a pretty well-defined peak of um, TBX binding a little bit downstream of LAUSI6, which overlapped with the predicted TBX binding sites that we had defined. And um, just uh, as, a, as a small note that the, the quality of, the, of this chip sequencing experiment was very good, we could derive from the peaks where we found TBX bound a motif that looks practically identical to the known binding site for TBX38 uh, that had been uh, determined in vitro. Okay, so we found this uh, peak, this, this uh, binding site for TBX3738 in the Lausis 6 locus. Now, is it functional? Is, is this the site uh, through which the T-box factors exert their function? I told you the, these factors are necessary for Lausis 6 expression. So what we decided to do was to go to the Lausis 6 locus and using CRISPR-Cas9, we engineered a YFP and we see expression of YFP in one neuron, which is the left AUC neuron. But on top of that, we engineered a small deletion. This is a deletion of 150 base pairs that takes out the sequence in which we find this TBX binding site, uh, the, this peak of TBX binding. And when we do that, we completely lose expression of YFP, suggesting that much like TBX3738 uh, are necessary, this binding site is necessary. And therefore, this is where um, their function is, is exerted. We also wanted to look at the, um, instead of looking at a reporter, to look at the actual activity of LAUSI6. And as I told you, LAUSI6 is necessary to introduce this asymmetry between the two ASC neurons. So what we looked is we, we monitored that asymmetry by looking at GCY5, which should be expressed only in the right ASC neuron in wild type animals. That's what we observe. But if we delete these binding sites, now all animals express the right specific marker in both ASC neurons, suggesting that this asymmetry is perturbed if we delete just this little binding site for TBX3738. So we know that these TBOX factors act directly on the LAUSI6 locus. And as I told you, it was um, um, reported by the PRIEST lab that these factors act only, are expressed only transiently. So we wanted to explore that further and really um, uh, test that as stringently as possible. How transient is expression of these transcription factors? Because this would be very important to, um, to understand how do they act on the Lausi 6 locus? How do they have an impact on the Lausi 6 locus at this endpoint? So we took advantage of the TBX37 GFP fusion that we had. And we, of course, looked at expression of of the TBOX factors. And it's true, much like the priest lab had reported, we also see transient expression. And then it goes away um, as uh, development progresses. However, uh, we were not fully satisfied by this because, of course, there's, as you can probably see, there's a lot of background. And not being able to detect something doesn't mean that it's not there and that perhaps there's some TBX37 that remains bound to the Lausi 6 logos over development and still is able to act at that endpoint. So we designed an experiment that is a forced degradation ex experiment of TBX, again, taking advantage of the GFP fusion. And for that, we used a system that consists of a GFP, a, a nanobody that recognizes GFP and is fused to a ubiquitin ligase adapter. So if we express this uh, fusion protein, it will recognize GFP tagged proteins and it will target them for degradation. So with this setup, we could uh, try to degrade TBX37 GFP. And if we can control the timing of expression of these uh, nanobody CIF1 fusion, we could test whether TBX37 is really continuously required um, over the whole development. And as a control, we will have uh, expression of CIP1, but without the nanobody. So this will express the same adapter, but without uh, tethering it to the GFP tagged TBX 
So here's the experiment. Um, and one thing I didn't mention is we control the timing of expression of these uh, nanobodies if one fusion by putting it under a heat shock promoter. This is the best way we have in C. elegans to control timing of expression. And so if we do this and we heat shock early targeting TBX for degradation at its peak, what we see is that embryos look uh, so for those of you who are not familiar, this is a very malformed embryo. This is a nice wild type embryo, but this embryo where we degrade TBX37 looks actually identical to a TBX3738 uh, double mutant animal. So what this means is that our degran system is very efficient at degrading TBX. Also, none of these animals is able to turn on lousy 6 while all control animals develop morphologically normally and turn on lousy 6 Okay, so the Degrin works. If we now heat shock, uh, to, so we now activate expression of the Degrin 40 minutes later, which is roughly the duration of a cell division, now the embryos don't care and don't care at all. Essentially, degrading TBX at this later time point has absolutely no effect either on morphology or on Lousy 6 expression, very strongly indicating that these factors are only necessary early on. One can degrade them later on and development continues normally. So we were uh, very satisfied to see this because it means that TBX3738 are not required late, but we wanted to explore a little bit further the temporal requirement for the uh, for TBX uh, transcription factors. And what we wanted to ask was whether um, if we provide these TBOX factors later on, are they able to uh, activate the Lausi 6 locus or is there or do they really need to act at that early time point? And for that, we now uh, express TBX37 under a heat shock promoter, and we provide TBX at different time points. Now, in, the, in this lineage, TBX3738 are already expressed early on, and so we cannot uh, infer too much from what's happening here, but we have a very nice uh, internal, internally controlled system because we have a symmetric lineage that does not express TBX3738. Uh, so we can now ask, does expression of TBX37 at different time points, is it able to activate Lousy 6 expression in the right ASC neuron as well? So here are the results of the experiment. What we're looking at is how many animals turn on Lousy 6 in the right neuron as well. And what you can see is that if we heat shock during this early time window up to about 180 minutes, or so roughly until about this time point, we can activate Lousy 6 expression in the right ASC neuron in practically all animals. However, beyond that time point, we can provide TBX3738 to these cells, but they will not activate Lousy 6 expression. So what this tells us is that the TBOX factors really need to act during this early time window of development. And beyond that time window, we think this is telling us something about what happens to the Lousy 6 locus. The Lousy 6 locus becomes refractory to activation at later time points, not only by key one, which we suspected because we, we think that is why Q1 is unable to turn on Lousy 6 here in the absence of priming, but surprisingly also to TBX. Providing TBX late is not able to activate Lousy 6. So we think this tells us that these TBOX factors are not really acting like pioneer factors, but rather they are opportunistic transcription factors that turn on or that prime a locus during a time window that is permissive for that to happen. So what happens to, uh, to the Lousy 6 locus? Can we get a little bit higher resolution about what's happening uh, at this locus over time? So for that, we decided to, we, we would love to look at, uh, at the chromatin state and, and, and um, different aspects of chromatin on this locus at different time points, but the, the material that we have is relatively limited because we have to sort cells from these different lineages uh, from dissociated embryos at different time points. And so, we managed to, uh, to set up a system in which we can label the different lineages. We can synchronize embryos and sort cells from either ABA or ABP. And the amount of material that we get is enough for us to do a taxic, which is the, this transposase mediated um, accessibility assay that tells us where DNA is accessible for transposition. So 
we did this, uh, in, uh, the first time point at which we did this is this 90 minute time point, which is at the peak of TVX expression. That is at the same time point at which we had done our TVX chip. And if you look at the ex DNA accessibility in ABA at this early time point, we can see that there's a very clear region of uh, accessible DNA that overlaps perfectly with the TBX binding site. So this is not terribly surprising since we know the T-box factors are binding there. Typically there's breathing and that generates accessible DNA. In the AVP lineage where the T-box factors are absent, there's absolutely no accessibility. And I kept here these locus um, uh, to show you that the, the experiment worked, so there is signal in, in other loci. In fact, these two, these two lineages are very, very similar, except for in about 10% of um, differentially accessible regions, most of which overlap with TBX uh, binding sites. Now, the curious thing was when we looked at the 200 minute time point, at this time point here, because at that time point, I've shown you the TBOX factors are not no longer there. They're no longer required, they're no longer active, and yet we still see differential accessibility of the lousy 6 locus uh, in ABA-derived cells versus ABP-derived cells. So this was very intriguing to us because it suggests that this accessible state that is established by TVX3738 is maintained or, or persists to some extent um, at later time points. And finally, we performed a taxic in the isolated ASC left and right neurons. And what we can see here is that there is, again, differential accessibility uh, at the, in, in the left neuron relative to the right neuron. But accessibility is now shifted, clearly shifted upstream of the locus. And I have a schematic here. Um, the accessibility early on overlaps with the TBX binding site, but accessibility in the mature neuron actually overlaps fully with the known key one binding site that had been defined for the lousy 6 locus and with the promoter of lousy 6. So we think this differential accessibility at this time point tells us that um, in the left neuron, key one is able to bind and promote transcription, while in the right neuron, even though key one is there, it is it cannot do anything on the lousy 6 locus. So uh, thinking about how do these transcription factors initiate this uh, accessible state? What, and what do they do to the lousy 6 locus to prime it? We uh, decided to ask, where do they promote transcription? They are transcription factors. So we asked, uh, do they generate any RNA from this locus? Even though I've, I've shown you, I, I didn't make this point specifically uh, early on, but when we look at reporters for lousy 6, we only see strong GFP or YFP expression in the mature neuron. But could it be that there is transcription early on when these T-box factors first come on and that that um, has an impact on the, on the accessible state of the locus? And um, we decided to use single molecule in situ hybridization to look at this because we expected that signal might be very low of uh, transcripts um, on the locus. And because lousy 6 is a microRNA, and it produces a very short transcript, we needed to do these experiments in a locus where we had engineered a YFP instead of lousy 6 so that the transcript that is produced is bigger and we can actually probe for it um, using this method. So what we, uh, what we saw using this method, I will show you um, both right away, is that we indeed at the very early uh, time points, and this is the time point at which TVX3738 come on, we already see transcription, a little bit of transcription in the sense direction, but primarily transcription in the anti-sense direction. And we can see these relatively strong foci in the nucleus that indicate typically the site of transcription. We see that transcription both in the sense and anti-sense direction, but primarily we think in the anti-sense orientation, persist through development. And at the end, when the ASC neuron is born, it's filled with sense transcript, but there's not so much antisense uh, transcript anymore. So we think that, um, and one thing I'm not showing you here, but that we also did is we, we did um, these in situ hybridizations both in 
a TBX3738 double mutant, and also in a strain where we deleted their binding sites. And in both cases, both these signals are completely gone. So this early onset of transcription is dependent on uh, TBX3738. So fine, I mean, the, we have these transcription factors that bind here, they promote transcription, but that doesn't tell us that transcription is important. Of course, these are transcription factors. They might just sit there, promote transcription. But we wanted to try to, um, to, to address whether this transcription was just a side product of binding or if it really is necessary to establish this competent state of the Lausi 6 locus. And so for that, we engineered a, a, a locus in which we removed or we deleted the TBX binding sites and we replaced them with UAS uh, sites, which are the binding sites for the yeast transcription factor GAL4. Now, this, um, this construct doesn't express any GFP because there's no TBX binding sites, there, there's no priming by TBX3738, and therefore key one cannot um, activate transcription of LAUSI6. But what happens if we now bring in a transcriptional activator? So what we did was we brought in GAL4 uh, fused to VP64. This is uh, four copies of the VP16 transcriptional activator. And when we do that, now pretty much all animals recover expression of uh, this LAUSI6 GFP reporter in the left ASC neuron. While if we tether to this locus, just the GAL4 DNA binding domain without the transcriptional activator, none of these animals express any GFP. One important thing is that this GAL4 uh, VP64 transcriptional activator is expressed under the TBX promoter. So it recapitulates that early ABA specific expression of TBX3738. So what this experiment told us is that we need to bring in a transcriptional activator to the locus at this early time point in order to uh, enable the later transcription of LAUSI6 by key one Bringing just a DNA binding domain is unable to do that. So that really hinted that transcription was necessary. So to try to um, address this a little bit further, we did a similar experiment in which instead of replacing the TBX binding sites by the UAS sites, we added the UAS sites right downstream of the TBX binding site. So in this construct, TBX3738 can bind early and that primes the locus for later uh, transcription by key one. And so this locus is expressed normally. If we now bring the GAL4 DNA binding domain next to TBX3738, nothing happens, all of these animals still express uh, the reporter in the left ASC neuron. But if we now bring in the transcriptional repressor Groucho, which is called ANC37 in C. elegans, that com almost completely abolishes um, transcription from the Lausi6 logo. So if we bring a repressor next to TBX3738 at this early time point, we kill the later expression of, um, of this reporter by key one. So this was a very good indication that uh, that Sorry, transcription I, is actually- Can I interrupt you just Yes, one please. Mayra yes. Furlan here. Hello, nice to meet you. Hi, Mar Mayra. Um, just a question. So this experiment with the GAL4 activator, did you test um, if this works once the, the locus is refractory? Refract Sorry. Thank you so much. That is my next slide. <laughs> so exactly. So this is a very, very important uh, question because um, for a number of reasons. So this is an artificial activator. It's a strong transcriptional activator also. So it could be that uh, we're just hitting the locus with a big hammer. Uh, so we, we also um, wanted to see whether this behaved similar to, um, to the TBX mediated uh, priming. And uh, what we did was a very similar experiment to what we did before, but now we... Uh, 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 sorry. But now what we do is, is we um, express the GAL4VP64 protein fusion under the heat shock promoter, and we provide uh, this fusion at different time points. 
And we're now monitoring expression of this locus that has the UAS sites. And when we do that, we see a practically identical time course of activation of the Lausi 6 locus. If we provide the GAL4 VP64 early on until about yeah, 180 uh, minutes, which is around here, again, we can um, activate Lausi 6 expression in all animals, but beyond that time point, we again lose the ability to activate this locus. So um, the other important thing is that this also, again, reinforced that the specificity of Lausi 6 expression is given by the intersection of an early activator in this lineage and key one, because we only saw expression in the ASC neurons, although the heat shock treatment itself sometimes causes this weird um, ectopic expression in the tail, but the, the reporter expression is um, in the ASC neurons. So, um, so with these experiments, I, I think we gained quite a bit of understanding about what this primed state of the Lausi 6 locus is. It, we think it's a state that needs to be established during a particular window in development and that requires um, the, the establishment of an active transcriptional state early on, even though this level of transcription is not enough to produce Lousy 6. So if we were to look at GFP expression, there's no GFP expression until the neuron is born and Q1 really boosts transcription from this locus. But there is a low level of transcription early on and there is antisense transcription, which are necessary, we think, to, to establish this competent state. This is what our experiment suggests. So we try to explore a little bit uh, and we also know that the expression of uh, TBX3738 and their function is only transient. So we have begun addressing um, how is this competent state maintained over time. And I'm not going to give you a full answer. I, I just want to disclose that right away. But I want to tell you what we know about how this state is maintained. So we have this asymmetric trigger of TBX 3738 that primes the Lausi 6 locus on the left side. Um, and I. I think the experiments I've shown you really tell us that TBX3738 are themselves not required all throughout the lineage. But of course, TBX3738 activate expression of many different genes. So it could be that TBX3738 turn on something else that lasts throughout the lineage and acts at the end together with Q1 to activate Lousy 6 expression. So we wanted to try to address whether there's any target of TBX or any other asymmetrically expressed protein that could be important for the maintenance of uh, this as initial asymmetric trigger. So what we did is we, um, we decided to work in a TBX3738 mutant background because in that background, uh, there is no um, asymmetry between these two lineages. These two lineages develop really symmetrically, and they both give rise to um, ASC neurons that will not express Lousy 6 in this case. There is, uh, a, um, in some fraction of the cases, because of uh, some um, differences in, in inductions in, in these embryos, they sometimes give rise to three ASC neurons instead of two, and that's why here we have three uh, labeled cells with the ASC marker. But um, in essence, these two lineages develop mostly symmetrically. So what we decided to do was ask, OK, now in this symmetric background, where there's no TBX3738, what happens if we induce asymmetric, these, if we provide this asymmetric trigger in the form of GAL4 VP64? Because we can still express this GAL4 VP64 fusion protein under the TBX37 promoter, and that will turn on asymmetrically, even though the, later on the TBXs are not there. So now we have a situation in which we have an asymmetric trigger in, a, in an otherwise symmetric uh, transacting factor environment. And what we found in this case was that this asymmetric trigger was sufficient to turn on Lausi 6 expression in one of the two or one of the three in, in some cases, ASC neurons that were produced in these animals. So what this tells us is that there is no other uh, direct target of TBX3738 or no other asymmetric uh, protein 
that is necessary to maintain this asymmetric state of the Lausus 6 locus that is induced early on. And so what we think, even though we don't have, uh, again, a full answer, is that if there are other factors that are required to maintain or to propagate this competent state, they are going to be factors that are symmetrically expressed, if not even ubiquitously expressed. Uh, so we have some ideas, we have some uh, candidate transcription factors, but also chromatin modifiers that came up from different genetic screens and are necessary for Lausi 6 um, expression later on. So with that, I will uh, give you the very last piece of data, uh, which is that the um, we, we did uh, an RNAi screen to try to identify uh, other, I mean, clearly this smells a lot like chromatin. Um, and so we, we wanted to know whether there's chromatin modifiers that are necessary for Lausis expression. And we did uh, some screens also in Oliver's lab. They had done pre uh, screens previously related to this ASC asymmetry. And what we all came up with, and, and uh, here there are a few things that came up from these screens, but what I really want to highlight from this screen is that we got many components of the set one or compass complex. So there's this one, this one, this one, and this one. So these are all factors that when we knock them down, we lose expression of Lausi 6. Um, I'm showing here the composition of the Drosophila compass complex, but it's extremely similar in C. elegans, and we really hit pretty much every component of this complex. So this complex methylates histone three on lysine four, which is a mark that is associated with transcriptional activation. But of course, if you knock down a chromatin modifier, such a broad acting protein, you might mess up Lausi 6 expression for a whole number of reasons. So we really wanted to know that the Lausi 6 locus itself is methylated on uh, lysine four and that this methylation is important. So the experiment that we came up with is the following. We generated again a, a locus in which we introduced the UAS um, binding sites in an intron of our GFP. So this locus is expressed normally because the TVXs can bind, uh, they can prime the locus, key one then can bind, and we can see here three different control lines where uh, this locus is expressed normally also if we tether just the GAL4 DNA binding domain. But if we now tether an enzyme that removes the methylation of uh, histone 3 lysine 4, we actually start losing um, Lausi 6 expression. And it's more prominent when we tether RBR2, which is an enzyme that removes uh, trimethylation of, um, actually now I'm not sure, trimethylation or dimethylation, I apologize. I can um, confirm uh, after we finish the talk. But, methylation of lysine 4, uh, and basically where this is uh, expressed with a TBX promoter. So this is brought onto the locus early on. At the time when TBX3738 are acting, we also bring this demethylase. And now we have a lot of animals that fail to really activate Lausi 6 expression. So we think um, this methylation is important for, for Lausi 6 expression. So, um, essentially, this is a summary of the uh, what I told you are the mechanistic insight that we have gained into um, how this locus can be activated by the combinatorial action of these two transcription factors that are separated by four cell divisions during during development. I'm not going to recapitulate all of these because I see I'm running out of time and I want to tell you one last thing, which is that these two AS neurons are just one pair out of about 10 pairs of neurons that develop through these same asymmetric pathways. So if TBX3738 are priming the Lausi 6 locus uh, for asymmetric expression between the left and right AC neurons, we also wondered if there's other genes that are asymmetrically primed between these two neurons. And this could be a mechanism to generate other neuronal asymmetries. And uh, I will just show you one uh, very quick case in which we actually find that this gene that is downstream of Lausi 6 is in fact also asymmetrically expressed in other neuron pairs that have this asymmetric origin. And so what we are um, thinking at the moment is that this might be a broader mechanism for 
um, generation of cell type diversity in, in development, very specifically in the case of C. elegans, we're further exploring these neurons that have different asymmetric origins. But the reality is that many, many, there are many examples of this type of development in which two cells arrive to the same terminal differentiation program through different pathways. So these are what we call convergent cell identities. And uh, the ASC neurons are an example of these. But there's many, many instances in, in the development of C. elegans. And you can see them in the lineage. So there's you can get muscle cells that look practically identical, but they develop from different paths. And if we look at their gene expression profiles, they're in fact different. So we think that there's uh, potentially many more instances of, of these. And this is also true not only in C. elegans, but also in other animals in which, um, for example, in, in the mouse, um, the, the gut endoderm has is made from cells that come from very different lineages. The same is true for cells that, de that develop from either mesoderm or the neural crest, which are very different developmental lineages, and yet they produce very similar cell types, all sorts of smooth muscle, for example. And uh, there's more and more examples of these coming up now that we can trace the developmental histories of cells using single cell uh, sequencing. So with that, uh, now I'm really closing. What I told you today is uh, our efforts to understand the mechanism of what we think is a very interesting uh, case of transcription regulation by which two transcription factors separated over time give rise to this very unique intersection that define um, specificity of gene expression across two neurons and therefore neuronal diversity. We think that this can be the direct implication of this mechanism is in generating additional diversity in the, uh, in the nervous system of C. elegans. But more broadly, this idea of um, taking advantage, I mean, this is something that happens during the development of every single cell. And in fact, there are many examples out there of, of what we refer to here as priming. Um, uh, of, of gene expression that, that is done uh, before the gene really needs to come on. Now, all of these examples of priming, we think, have been primarily studied in the context of generating robust gene expression. So priming is often thought of as being required to generate either a rapid um, activation of transcription or a, or a high activation of transcription. But what we are saying here is that uh, this type of priming can also be exploited to generate cell diversity if it is superimposed with symmetric transcriptional programs at the end. And so much like spatial integration of transcription factors, we think this has the potential to be a, a broader mechanism to generate cell type diversity. So with that, I end by thanking uh, my lab, the people who did the work. I mentioned this was started by a fantastic postdoc, Thomas Daniel, uh, and uh, continued by Julianne Charest, a PhD student. But really, this was a, a, a team effort with uh, uh, work from many, um, many lab members. I would like to thank uh, the, my community of collaborators, our funding, and thank you again very, very much for the invitation. I hope that, um, yeah, you will have some questions for me. Muchas gracias, Lisa. Muy bonito trabajo. Muchas gracias. Hay un par de preguntas. No sé si alguien... O oh, bueno, que empiecen a darlas. Mayra, ¿tienes preguntas? Sí, aprovecho otra, otra pregunta. Muchas gracias sí. por la charla. Muy interesante el, el trabajo. Gracias. Eh, quería preguntarte entonces, digamos, es, es sorprendente que, que aún echándole un activador, ¿no? Este... No, no responde, ¿no? No es capaz de, de, de prender. Ese, esa, esa firma epigenética que se genera uh -huh. en esta zona, eh, ¿han checado, por ejemplo, si está pólicom, enriquecido? O, o, ¿Qué es lo que pasa que realmente ya no, no puedes activarlo? Uh -huh. Sí, es, eh, es una excelente pregunta y claramente este, este mecanismo no debería funcionar, solo, no, no se basa solamente en activación, Necesit para generar esta asimetría necesitas represión, porque si no, obviamente, Q1 podría activar la, la, la transcripción en, en, en un momento más tardío. Eh, hemos mirado lo siguiente, miramos mutantes de Polycom, eh, y no tienen absolutamente ningún efecto, 
O sea, lo que esperábamos es que en un mutante de Polycom podría ser que, que Key One eh, pueda ya de por sí activar la UC6 también en la, en la célula derecha, pero eso no ocurre. Lo otro que hemos hecho es el, el experimento este donde hacemos heat shock de TBX o heat shock de GAL4 PP64 a distintos puntos. Llega un punto que, se, que, el, que el locus se vuelve refractario. Lo que, lo que hicimos es cruzamos eso al mutante de Polycom también y vemos a ver si, si se demora el momento o, o si se alarga la ventana durante la cual podemos activar la UCI6 y no tiene absolutamente ningún efecto tampoco ahí. Hemos mirado eh, eh, también metilasas de H3K9, metiltransferasa de, de, de K9, y tampoco vimos efecto, pero hay mucha redundancia ahí y no, no, creo que no tenemos todavía bien cubierto ese tema. Lo que estamos tratando de hacer ahora es usar este sistema de tethering que tenemos porque eso nos permite traer las demetilasas eh, o, o traer, forzar la, la, sí, la localización de, de metilasas y demetilasas y ver si podemos encontrar de esa manera eh, quién está reprimiendo. Lo que, te, lo que tenemos ahora, aparentemente, lo que, lo que sí parece tener un papel en, eh, en la represión es HP1. Tenemos un mutante con eh, un doble mutante de HP1. HP like 1 and 2, y ahí sí vemos que si hacemos heat shock eh, de BP64, de GAL4 BP64, un momento más tardío, todavía tenemos activación. O sea que, pero no es, no es total la ventana, no, no se abre totalmente, pero se alarga. Así a lo que, mejor puede ser a nivel de metilación de ADN también. No sé si en si en si Elegance. No, que si Elegance no tiene. No, si no, Elegance no tiene. Así que eso. Eh, esa es, sí, eh, hay unos ejemplos lindísimos en, en biología de, de otros animales donde sí, la, la metilación a nivel de DNA ayudaría a generar estas, eh, sí, estas marcas más fuertes, pero en, en nuestro gusano no hay. Muy bien, muchas gracias. No, gracias a vos. Pablo, ¿puedo? Y sí, vas, Félix. Leo al final las que están en el chat. Yo también después del doctor. Bueno, este, antes que nada, felicidades. Muy... Como dice Mayra, un trabajo muy bonito. Yo podría entrar a hacer muchísimas preguntas, pero me voy a quedar en una más bien conceptual para uh -huh. tener una, una discusión que creo que podría ser interesante. Tú partes del principio que conocemos de que los factores transcripcionales van a, van a actuar de forma combinatoria, o sea, van a ser combinatorias de factores. Uh -huh. Pero a mí lo que me llama la atención es que aquí tienes un microRNA que es fundamental para, para definir la simetría y que además está regulado por un factor transcripcional. Entonces, conceptualmente es contradictorio. Uh -huh. La combinatoria implica pues, varias, y eso es lo que da la riqueza y la especificidad. Y creo yo también da la protección a la pérdida de algún componente. Es decir, a esta discusión voy a añadir el otro concepto de redundancia. Uh -huh. Creo yo que en, organismo, en otro tipo de organismos, como los vertebrados o mamíferos, hay mucha redundancia en los factores transcripcionales. Por eso en los enhances y promotores tienes que, se tienen combinatorias grandes, son muchos. Sí. Pero aquí lo, lo fascinante es que es uno. Entonces, esa es mi pregunta conceptual, uh -huh. ¿no? <ríe> Por favor, sí. gracias. Sí, 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 no, es súper interesante. Perdón, sí. y, ot y otra es que me llama la atención lo mismo en el sentido de la función del microRNA. Es decir, uh -huh. tú tienes un eje, el priming, uh -huh. que es bastante único, donde un factor transcripcional regula de forma contundente a un microRNA. Pero ese, con, ese microRNA tiene uh -huh. que amplificar su efecto sobre muchos target genes, ¿no? Que puedes además conocerlos. Entonces, ¿qué puedes decir sobre eso también? Sí. Gracias. Encantada. Muchas gracias. Eh, bueno, la primera parte sobre este factor de transcripción Key One es, es realmente una, creo yo, una excepción incluso en C. elegans, que este factor de transcripción es lo que han llamado el master regulator de la identidad de estas neuronas. Eh, otras neuronas en C. elegans que han sido estudiadas en el laboratorio de Oliver Hobart necesitan 
combinaciones de, de factores de transcripción para, para adquirir eh, la expresión de todos los genes que determinan su, su identidad. Pero las neuronas estas, ASI, es, eh, es realmente el, el, este factor Q1 es el principal y tiene binding sites en la mayoría de los genes que se expresan en, eh, en estas neuronas. Uh -huh. creo, que es un, creo que es un caso muy particular. No, sé, no conozco otras, otras células que estén definidas por, exacto, por un master regulator tan, tan, eh, tan bien definido y que es un factor de transcripción. Eh, con respecto, o sea, eso lo único que puedo decir es que es, que es una excepción incluso en, en C. elegans. Eh, y con respecto al target de, del microRNA, esto también lo sabemos muy bien por otro trabajo que, eh, en el que estuve involucrada, pero también llevado a cabo por otros estudiantes del laboratorio de, de Oliver, que este factor, este microRNA, regula un factor de transcripción. Y regula realmente un factor de transcripción porque eso, la, la genética es súper clara, eh, reprime a un factor de transcripción que se expresa en las dos neuronas, el, el factor de transcripción este también está regulado por Q1 y se prende en las dos neuronas, pero la UC6 lo apaga en la neurona izquierda, uh -huh. y eso hace que otro factor de transcripción se exprese, en la, que, que es reprimido por, por el target de la UC6, se exprese. Entonces, genera esta clásica situación de dos eh, factores de transcripción mutuamente excluyentes que determinan la, las diferencias en identidad de estas neuronas. Y sabemos que es solamente este, fa este factor de transcripción es el target del microRNA, porque si mutamos el binding site del microRNA en el 3'UTR de este factor de transcripción, uh -huh perdemos la regulación del, del factor de transcripción. Tenemos absolutamente el mismo fenotipo que sacando el microRNA. Okay. O sea que en, en un caso donde el microRNA está, pero puede regular cualquier otro target, salvo este factor de transcripción, hay una completa pérdida de, simetría, de asimetría de las neuronas. Eh, así que es, es un caso muy particular, pero puede tener que ver, en, en mi especulación, con el... Eh, con el hecho de que es un microRNA evolutivamente también muy nuevo, o sea que adquirió eh, esta, esto, este, el sitio de binding de Q1 probablemente relativamente eh, reciente, y, y lo mismo con el, con, con el target. No ha tenido tiempo de adquirir muchos otros targets. Gracias. Por favor. ¿Puedo preguntar? Creo que sí. Hola, ¿qué tal? Soy Julián Valdés. Eh, muy bonito seminario. Eh, yo también trabajo con C. Elegance y algo del sistema nervioso. Y muy bueno, yo, yo más bien te preguntaría, este, ok, tú por ejemplo ves cuando haces tu degron que te, te, tardío no tienes efecto. Uh -huh. Pero yo te preguntaría si hiciste alguna medición conductual, por ejemplo en sensibilidad a, a, a sodio o a cloro, dado que estas neuronas están involucradas. Uh -huh. Porque podría ser, ok, bueno, a lo mejor tú no ves de pronto que cambie demasiado, pero quién sabe la funcionalidad de, 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 de las neuronas. ¿Hicieron algún ensayo? Sí. sí, es una muy buena pregunta. Nosotros, nosotros la verdad que no hicimos nada de, de la parte de, de conducta. El mutante de la UCI, si no se expresa la UCI6 y si se expresan los marcadores de la célula derecha en la célula izquierda, el animal lo que no puede hacer es distinguir un, eh, un gradiente de una de estas sales en un background del otro. Porque las neuronas comparten algunas funciones, pero eh, necesita la simetría para poder, para poder distinguir, o sea, si tiene un, un background que, saturante, de concentración saturante de, de cloruro, y sobre eso se le pone un gradiente de sodio, un animal wild type puede, por más que está saturado de cloruro, puede encontrar el gradiente de sodio. Pero un animal que no tiene esta simetría no puede hacer eso, porque se saturan las dos neuronas. Eh, la verdad que no hicimos los ensayos conductuales, pero como vemos, tan marcada pérdida de asimetría en la expresión de, de estos marcadores claves, eh, eso es lo que, lo que tomamos como como output del, del desarrollo de las neuronas. Claro, claro y también, bueno, las, las neuronas son posmitóticas, ¿no? Entonces, 
en el sentido de una reprogramación funcional tardía uh -huh. sería quizás difícil. Sí, probablemente. Nosotros igual mayormente miramos el embrión y las larvas tempranas, así que no, eh, cosas mucho más tarde no, no, no hemos mirado. Muy bien, gracias. Es súper interesante, gracias. Eh, hola, ¿qué tal? Yo soy Diana Escalante. Este, no sirve mi cámara. <risa> Pero, ah, <risa> estaba mirando. O sea, está súper interesante siempre esto de la historia del huevo y la gallina, ¿no? O sea, cómo es que te, como TBX inicia su expresión asimétricamente. Y me preguntaba ah. si era posible que, o sea, desde antes, ¿no? Cuando se establece el, el, los, los blastómeros, uh -huh. ¿existe algún, alguna ya diferencia en términos de, por ejemplo, TATS, topológicamente, uh -huh. de alguna manera haga justamente este asunto de eh, um, expresión asimétrica. Sí, 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 excelente pregunta. Eh, no, no explique mucho cómo se genera la asimetría, lo que sabemos es que estos dos blastómeros ABA y ABP surgen de una división simétrica y son eh, inicialmente idénticos y tienen idéntico potencial. Eh, pero lo que ocurre es que, no sé si se ve todavía el cursor ahí, que la célula más posterior, que es la que va a dar origen a la línea germinal, expresa un ligando de notch. Y ese, esa eh, inducción por notch genera la simetría entre ABA y ABP. Eso es lo que, lo que genera después la, la expresión de, de los TBX es en, en los descendientes de ABA, pero no de ABP. Con respecto a TATS, es súper interesante lo que... Eh, hay dos cosas. Una es que se han, eh, se han hecho estudios de, así de, de estructura del, de, de los cromosomas en C. elegans y no se ha visto mucha estructura, mu muchos TATS, eh, salvo en el cromosoma X, que tiene una estructura muy particular porque tiene... Eh, eh, dosage compensation y eso genera tiene unas condensinas eh, especiales que generan una estructura que se, que se puede ver en estos experimentos pero no se ha visto mucha estructura en otros cromosomas, es posible que, es, que sea, porque el, el genoma es bastante más chico, entonces eh, puede ser que estas estructuras sean más chicas y que se necesiten métodos con más alta resolución eh, pero eso es algo que todavía sí se, 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 se debate bastante nosotros no hemos hecho ningún tipo de experimentos de, 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 sí, de, de esos, pero, pero es lo que, lo que escucho en el campo. Muy linda tu charla. Muchas Vamos gracias. gracias. ¿Alguien más quiere hacer preguntas? Sí, yo, Paula. Buenos días o buenas bueno. tardes. Habla Fernando López Casillas. Este... ¿Eh? Muy bonita plática, eh, me encantó el concepto de la segregación temporal. Y lo que yo te quería preguntar es, eh, ¿en vertebrados existe un sistema semejante para hacer la simetría izquierda-derecha? Hmm. Eh, que yo sepa la, la generación de, de asimetría en el, en el cerebro de vertebrados es, es muy diferente. Eh, en C. elegans esto ocurre en la, en la segunda tercera división eh, celular en vertebrados es, eh, es mucho más adelante y la verdad es que me parece que no, no se sabe del todo los, los mecanismos que generan asimetría en, en vertebrados en el pez por ejemplo sí sé que hay una, una asimetría morfológica que se genera por el eh, eh, por el flujo que, eh, o, o por la, la motilidad de cilias que se, que se mueven siempre en, en una dirección particular y eso genera eh, flujo asimétrico y hay, y hay ciertas estructuras que se desarrollan más de un lado que del otro y eso a su vez eh, genera asimetrías funcionales en el cerebro eh, pero mucho más que eso no, no le puedo decir, perdón Muchas gracias este, ¿Puedo? Sí, doctor. Hola, soy Ricardo Tapia. Un gusto. Eh, 
Mucho gusto, Luisa. ¿Cómo están lo de las, las proteínas? Deben ser diferentes de cada uno de los dos lados de las neuronas, puesto que son sensibles a sodio o a, o a, o a cloro, según nos explicaste. Uh -huh. ¿Qué se sabe de, de, de eso? ¿Están localizados los genes que determinan la secuencia de esas proteínas? Uh -huh. Sí, lo que le puedo decir con respecto a eso es que estos genes de la familia de las guanilatos y clasas de membrana, eh, hay, es una familia que se ha expandido mucho en C. elegans. Otros animales tienen menos. C. elegans tiene eh, varias docenas de estas guanilatos y clasas de membrana que son muy similares en el dominio transmembrana y el intracelular y difieren en su dominio extracelular. Y otra estudiante en el laboratorio de Oliver Hobart había hecho experimentos en los cuales eh, hizo, generó quimeras de estas guanilatos y clasas, poniendo el dominio extracelular de una que está del lado derecho en el lado izquierdo y viceversa, y aparentemente, eh, o sea, esto correlacionaba muy bien con la habilidad de las neuronas de responder a, a los distintos iones. Es difícil mostrar que estos son los sensores realmente de, 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 de los iones que están en, en el medio, pero... Estas guanilatos y clasas eh, juegan, juegan un papel importante en la, eh, en la especificidad de, de la sensibilidad de estas neuronas. Y otra pregunta mucho más general o amplia. ¿Por qué tanta complicación de regulación durante el desarrollo para que de un lado se desarrollen neuronas que son sensibles a cierto ion y del otro lado ¿Hay alguna ventaja Ajá. evolutiva o alguna cosa? Porque uno pensaría que es demasiada complicación en el desarrollo, una regulación distinta de cada lado de las, de, del desarrollo de las neuronas para una función sensorial a iones que podía realizarse mucho más fácilmente de otra manera pensando en el desarrollo, ¿no? Que, sí. Sé que es una pregunta muy... <ríe> medio filosófica, pero sí. Pero sí. sí. <ríe> bueno, la, la superimposición de asimetría, ya sea en el sistema nervioso o, o de asimetría morfológica, es algo que, que genera complejidad, que, que le da más diversidad ¿no? al, al, eh, al organismo. En este caso, yo creo que para un organismo como C. elegans es muy importante tener esta, esta asimetría, porque tiene un número muy limitado de neuronas. Este gusanito genera uh -huh. 300 neuronas. Eh, y quizás es más difícil evolutivamente generar un nuevo tipo celular o, o, o poner esta función de sensorial en otra neurona. O sea, las neuronas sensoriales de C. elegans ya son polimodales, porque con un número muy acotado de neuronas, tiene que, que detectar un montón de diferentes eh, estímulos. Entonces, estas neuronas están, son ya bastante, bastante complejas, y quizá eh, esta fue la mejor solución que encontró la evolución para, para poder tener estas dos funciones separadas y, y poder llevar a cabo... O sea, lo que, lo que sí se sabe es que esto tiene una, una importancia conductual, como, como discutíamos antes, eh, que si, la, si esta simetría no existe, el, el animal no puede, no puede navegar un, un, o sea, ciertos estímulos, ¿no? no puede encontrar ciertos gradientes en el, eh, en el ambiente. Eh, entonces tiene una importancia funcional. Obviamente no sabemos la importancia ecológica que, que puede tener esto para el, para el animal, pero me imagino que si nosotros podemos medir algo en el laboratorio, en, en, el, eh, en su ambiente natural, esto tendrá, tendrá cierta importancia. Claro, sí. Algo así debe ser. Muchas gracias. No, gracias a usted. Luis, hay un par de preguntas de estudiantes. Una sí. en, en YouTube. Felicidades por tu trabajo, muy interesante. ¿Cuál puede ser el papel del transcrito antisentido de locos? Muy buena pregunta. Eh, no lo, eh, ¿Cómo? 
creo que hay otra que está asociada a esta, o sea, ella Ajá. misma pregunta si podría ser responsable de reclutar a los remodeladores de la cromatina en la región o podría estar protegiendo al transcrito sentido para que se traduzca tiempo después. Esa es María José Blanco. María José, muchas gracias por tu pregunta. Eh, lo que creemos es que el transcripto en sí posiblemente no tenga ninguna función, que lo que es importante es que haya transcripción a través de este locus para mantenerlo de cierta manera accesible. Eh, la razón por la que digo que creemos que el transcripto no tiene una función en particular es que podemos poner, eh, podemos reemplazar el microRNA por GFP e igual logramos la, la localización, la, la expresión específica de este gen en esta particular neurona. O sea que el, la naturaleza del transcripto no afecta la expresión a, a, a tiempos más tarde. Eh, pero sí el que haya transcripción eh, a través del locus, creemos que es lo importante para mantener la accesibilidad. Y si se generara mucho transcripto en, el, en la dirección en SENS, eh, entonces se generaría este microRNA a un, a un punto más temprano, lo cual no, no lo sabemos, pero puede ser que, que, no, sea, que no sea bueno para el, para el desarrollo. El microRNA se necesita solamente en la neurona madura, puede ser que si se expresa muy temprano eso eh, no, sea, no sea deseable. En cambio, un transcripto anti-SENS no genera microRNA, no, no hace nada. Aparentemente incluso se queda ahí en el núcleo eh, porque no lo vemos desparramarse por el citoplasma. Así que eso es nuestra, eh, lo, lo que creemos que, que, que provee este transcripto antisense es eso, es la capacidad de transcribir el locus sin generar un producto que, que genere problemas. Y otra de Martí. Wilson, eh, entiendo que existen locus que adquieren una firma epigenética que los hace resistentes, entre comillas, a cambios en su expresión genética. Por el contrario, también existen ejemplos de locus que son muy dinámicos, tanto transcripcional como epigenéticamente. ¿Se sabe cuáles son, pueden ser las características que definen estas diferencias tan pronunciadas? Eh, bueno, como discutíamos un poco antes, la, en, en otros sistemas la metilación del DNA genera una, una situación de represión muy estable. Eh, otras formas de represión muy, muy estable pueden estar dadas por también metilación de histonas en ciertas posiciones, como histona 3 en la lisina 9. Eso tiende a generar también heterocromatina muy estable que trae otros factores que compactan la cromatina. Eh, mientras que hay otras modificaciones de cromatina que, que tienden a mantener, por ejemplo, la acetilación tiende a mantener la cromatina en un estado más abierto, más flexible, eh, y, y bueno, y hay variantes entre medio, cosas que sabemos, cosas que no sabemos, así que hay mucho por, por aprender todavía ahí. Yo solo tengo una pregunta, ¿puedo hacerte una última? Sí, cómo no. ¿Qué hace C1 en la neurona derecha? O sea, ¿también regula un, un microRNA? O sea, porque parece que ahí la especificidad un, de célula la está dando más el microRNA que los factores transcripcionales, ¿no? Entonces, ¿se sabe qué pasa en el otro lado? Sí, lo que hace este factor de transcripción en, en realidad eh, activa la expresión de cientos de genes de ambos lados. Eh, y hay muchas propiedades de estas neuronas que son compartidas de ambos lados. Toda esa parte simétrica está dada también por la expresión de, de Key One, que genera, le da a la célula propiedades morfológicas y fisiológicas eh, que, que, que son simétricas. Además, eh, Key One es necesario para la expresión de todos los genes que también son asimétricos. Entonces hay otras... Eh, otros mecanismos interesantes de cómo, por ejemplo, GCY5, esta guanilato ciclasa que se expresa solamente del lado derecho, también necesita Key1. Pero en ese caso, Key1 trabaja de otra manera para generar esa, esa simetría. Eh, y eso, sí, eh, no está estudiado para, para muchos genes, pero para algunos entendemos que es o Key1 junto con otro factor de transcripción de, de manera eh, cooperativa como, como mostré en la introducción, pero hay otros casos donde eh, 
además de que igual hay un represor que, que no permite que se, exprese, que se exprese otro gen. Pero sí, que está involucrado en la expresión de prácticamente todos los genes de estas neuronas, tanto simétricos como asimétricos. Pero ningún micro -remio. No. Pues muchas gracias. No sé si alguien más tenga alguna pregunta. Creo que ya pregunté a los del chat y varias personas. Muy bien. Muchísimas gracias, Luisa. Muy, muy no, bien. muchas gracias a ustedes. Un montón de preguntas, me alegro. Y pues eh. a ver, ojalá tengamos oportunidad de, de verte después en vivo. Sí, con, espero que sí. Con alguna historia de microRNAs. Sería un gusto para mí. La próxima hablamos de microRNAs, eso. Sí. Pues muy y me bien. encantaría la próxima escuchar también en qué trabajan ustedes. Bueno, Luisa, de nuevo, muchas gracias. En nombre del Instituto, gracias por haber estado con nosotros. Gracias a ustedes. Realmente un gusto para mí. Gracias. Y bueno. Gracias, Paula. Gracias a todos.